Good morning. Welcome to our session on enhancing regulatory processes through RegTech. My name is Chris Calabia from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I just wanted to start off with a quick story. In June of 1815, 203 years ago, the Duke of Wellington led an army of 67,000 troops into battle against Napoleon Bonaparte in what is today Belgium. Napoleon had 69,000 troops, and so the outcome of the battle was really uncertain. After a fierce two days of fighting, in which Napoleon maintained the upper hand, the Duke of Wellington actually had to retreat to a place near a town called Waterloo, where the British, British troops reorganized, dug in, and waited for Napoleon to arrive. When Napoleon arrived, this time the British were better prepared for their, for their enemy. And with the help of Prussian troops that arrived just in time, they were managed to defeat Napoleon and ended the Napoleonic Wars. Now, as I mentioned at the time, no one was really certain that Wellington was going to win this battle because he was outnumbered slightly. However, according to legend, there was one family that found out the results of the Battle of Waterloo much sooner than anyone else in all of England, even before the British government. According to this legend, the Rothschilds family, which ran a, family, a system of banks, relied on carrier pigeons to tell them the results of the battle well before anyone else heard about it, so that they could then trade on that information before their competitors in the marketplace knew that the British had won and, and not lost the battle in Waterloo. So you might say that in the early 19th century, when people wanted to tweet, they used real birds. Of course, today we tweet with other tools, and today we're going to be talking a lot about how banks continue to use technology to try to get the upper hand and advantage in marketplaces, and we're going to shift focus a little bit today to talk as well about how regulators can use technology to improve their efficiency and their effectiveness and promote safety and soundness and consumer protection. So we're going to begin off today with Dr. Vladimir Tomsik, who's the Vice Governor of the Czech National Bank, who will share some of his country's experiences with regulating fintech in the marketplace, but also adopting fintech-like technology in the central bank to improve its supervision. After that, I'm looking forward to introducing you to the members of our panel, where we'll continue the discussion here in the fishbowl, as they call it. So, Dr. Tomsik. Dear Chairman, yeah, you can hear me. Dear Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming, and I'm very pleased to see all of you here in this, I mean, session, panel session. I'm very pleased, I mean, to be something as a team setter, a topic setter, and to talk about how we use, I mean, fintech, how we use regulatory, I mean, tech, and how we regulate it. I'm still waiting for the presentation. It should be uploaded. I have prepared like five, seven slides for you, and I promise I will not be reading them. I will just provide you with some very brief introduction how we use it. First of all, let me say a few words about the Czech National Bank. It's a central bank, so we are responsible for monetary policy as well as for supervision of the whole financial market in my country, in the Czech Republic. But, but what does it mean? It means when you are responsible for supervision of the whole financial market, well, we don't have enough capacity to be for on-site inspections everywhere, every time. Definitely not. We heavily rely on offline, I mean, I would say off-site supervision. It means we need data. We need to use, I mean, fintech to collect data, to have comparable data, and to work with that. And there is something that we can really be sure about. And this is that there are always some changes in the financial market, and we have to monitor those changes. But nevertheless, once we are talking about new technologies, about new fintech technologies, well, don't be surprised that it's mostly driven by big banks, at least in my country, because they do have enough capacity. They do have enough, I mean, I would say sources to invest it. But nevertheless, we also see some new small companies I mean, trying to use fintech and to really enter the market in the financial services. But those companies, they usually imitate what they see abroad. And how do we approach this regulation? So let me clarify. Do we have a presentation? Is it uploaded? Yeah. Yeah. Just press it. Go ahead. Yeah. Perfect. So, what I want to uh, share with you regarding our approach. First of all, I'm pretty sure that we should regulate business. No matter what kind of means the business is done. 
I really don't care whether the business in financial services is done by in traditional way to regulate capital, liquidity, etc., or whether it's I mean, done by new fintech technology. We have to regulate business. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's fair enough to also say that, well, can we apply the current I mean, regulation to regulate this business? If we can, just go ahead and do that. Because I think everybody, I personally believe that everybody will agree that right now we are living in the world with a really a new wave of regulation. After the financial crisis, I would say there is even too much regulation. Some people, they say, we don't need more regulation. We need smart regulation, better regulation. And finally, I think it makes sense to approach each business and to really be open to discuss and consult, I would say, really some, I would say, case by case, some businesses. So what I want to say, if we see new business, let's think whether we can use, I mean, current regulation to regulate it. And if it's not as really significant, I mean, the business, it's not, it not, if it doesn't pose any significant risk, maybe the question is whether we need to develop new regulation immediately. I think we should think about new regulation once we see there is a significant risk. Once we see there is a significant, I would say, portion of the business in the financial market. Of course, once we say yes, we always see some challenges. And I will just probably mention three very key challenges for us. The first one is we need to understand the new wave of business. If you don't understand it, it's very difficult to tackle it. It's very difficult to regulate it. It's very difficult to understand the consequences. And if you want to understand it, you need to have a good experts. And this is another challenge because Czech National Bank is a part of public sector. And you know, it's always very difficult to compete with salaries and some benefits to I mean private sectors. And it's really very, very, I mean, I would say skill labor demanding, I mean, issue to hire really new people which are experts in this new fintech regulation. And finally, Fair enough, I think we should do to support, I mean, growing business, we should support new innovative business. We should do that because everybody wants to see economic development. But on the other hand, we have to balance between consumer protections, financial stability. And this is not easy. And that's why I very much look forward to the discussions. Do we see some opportunities coming uh, from fintech and from, from new regulation? Sure. It's obvious. The most important, I mean, benefit is that I mean the firms using fintech they do have a better, I would say, approach to the financial market. They do have a better, I mean, approach to get new loans, to get new finance. And I mean, finally, I mean, it will help to foster economic development. It's cheaper, probably. It's faster. It's better for them. We also see some opportunities for customers and supervisors. I think the same holds for customers. Just imagine customers, I mean, coming from remote areas, from some rural areas. Once, do, once they use some fintech, they have better and faster approach for microfinance, for example, and to get a record in the financial services once they start with a small amount, you know, and I mean, it's proved they are reliable. They can ask for, I mean, Highest amount. And finally, they can ask for some, I mean, for example, mortgages. We also see some opportunities for supervisors. Because I, as a supervisor, and I started to mean my opening remarks, that we have to rely on off-site supervision. It's impossible to rely only on on-site supervision. And once you rely on off-site supervision, you need to collect data. You need to use this new technology to collect timely data, daily data, and they have to be comparable. And of course, I mean, you can exchange these data sets among other countries. So just probably, this is the not last one, but one before last one, I'm pretty sure as a supervisor, don't be afraid to use new technology to collect data and definitely mean to use and to be more effective in data assessments, exchange data, and definitely to have more customized procedures. And let me end up with two examples in which we use new fintech in our supervision in our central bank. The first one, we definitely, on a, I would say, 
not daily basis, but online basis, we monitor, we can call it as a capital market monitoring tool based on new fintech, based on new technology. We really, I would say, monitor screen market on time, and it helps us to avoid, I mean, to avoid any misunderstanding, avoid any misconduct, and to store all data. If there is any suspicions, we can immediately to prove it. And just probably last example, and I heard it in the previous session, you know, what is very popular? It's very popular to have initially currency offering, ICOs. And you know, once we are a central bank responsible for monetary policy, responsible for cash handling, we also would like to monitor if there is any initially currency offering where, which is linked to check corona, check currency. And this is not easy to monitor it, I mean, uh, just mm, case by case. You have to monitor it on time using this fintech data. So let me sum, sum it up. It's definitely, it poses new challenges, but I also see it poses really new, I would say, benefits for supervisors. And we always have to ask ourselves whether we have to regulate it immediately or whether we should wait for some other, I would say, signs. The chairman, I'm returning the floors to you. I will be very much happy to listen to discussions of all panelists. Thank you for inviting me. The presentation is available and you can always contact me via my email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tomsik. So, Dr. Tomczyk, you made a very important statement. You said we shouldn't be afraid of using new technology. And in the prior session, our colleague from Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance, Philip, mentioned that uh, regulators tend to be risk averse. Today, I'm pleased to invite and introduce you to some regulators who are not afraid of using te new technology. And so I'll start off by introducing directly opposite me, Dr. Montique Sanza Baganwa, the Deputy Governor of the National Bank of Rwanda. She has an illustrious career and worked in other sectors of government as well, and she was formerly Minister of Trade and Industry and the Minister of State for Economic Planning. So, Dr. Mon Monique, thank you and welcome to our session today. Sitting next to Dr. Monique is Ms. Rochelle Thomas, who is the Acting Deputy Director of Policy and Literacy Group in the Consumer Protection Department of Banco Central Pilipinas in Manila. She is a member of the AFI Financial Inclusion Strategies Peer Learning Group, and she was also a fellow in the Fletcher Leadership Program for Financial Inclusion. Uh, we just had the graduation the other day uh, here at, at in Sochi. So welcome, Rochelle. Next to Rochelle is Dr. Simone DeCastri, a director from BFA. He's also head of the RegTech for Regulators Accelerator Project. He's worked with global standard setters, senior policymakers, regulators, and private sector executives from more than 40 countries. And among other employers, uh, Simone has worked for AFI itself, as well as CGAP and GSMA. So welcome, Simone. And finally, let me introduce Dr. Setter Amediku, who's the head of the Payment Systems Department in the Bank of Ghana, and he's formerly head of the Financial Stability Department. And based on some conversations I had with him earlier, I learned that he's worked also extensively as a regulator and supervisor at the Central Bank in Ghana as well. So you're welcome to do, sir. Thank you for joining us. So Simone, I was wondering if you could help us just level set a little bit. And we talked in the opening remarks about new technologies, and Dr. Tomsek talked a little bit about some of the rapid change that's taking place and some of the technologies that bankers as well as supervisors are adopting. What is different about the technology today that is causing so much interest in this thing called RegTech? And also, what is RegTech? Thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you to for the colleagues of AFI for having me again here. Um, so let's take a step back a little bit, like where is really the, the problem today? I think we have, we have a few data that I wanted to throw in the conversation. We have $3.5 trillion of prevents from financial crime that are laundered through the formal financial system every year. Um, in Kenya, just as an example, but it's not different from many other countries, 21 banks have collapsed between 94 and 2016, and only in 2015 and 2016, uh, three banks counted for $2 billion of total assets. The bailout in 20, 2009 costed $700 billion. And according to the Elderman Trust Barometer, the financial sector is the less trusted economic formal sector by citizens all over the world. So I would say 
there is a little bit of a problem there. And today, in different sessions, we've been talking about sandboxes, fintechs, how to enable innovation. But like the state of the art is really that supervision is going through a big crisis. There is not enough capacity, there are not enough tools to be able to uh, take all the problems that today are faced by the financial service providers and by the customers. We know through SIGAP research the most of the customers in the world that we are serving through financial inclusion intermediaries are not, uh, they do not have access to recourse and redress mechanism. So if something goes wrong, the people that we've included in the financial sector, they don't know really what to do, where to go, where to find uh, assistance. Um, we have the problem of competition that is arising with all these huge, uh, big tech providers that are coming, and how do we drive really a healthy financial sector that also helps local fintech providers that are closer to their art and to their business, the interest of, of the low-income families probably, to grow in this context. So these are the bad news. The good news is, yes, there is technology that is advancing. So technology is relative mature today to provide uh, uh, the supervisors and the regulators with new tools that are able, enable them to do better their job, which is, as you were saying, supervision on site and really regulating it in a different way that is more proportional. Artificial intelligence has completely changed in the last few years. It really, we have the level of maturity when we can now trust and adopt some of these tools. Optical character recognition, uh, the computing power has grown incredibly, and the cost of all these, these tools has gone down. So the point today, it's about doing rec tech and doing soup tech, which is packaging these technologies to support the regulators and to support the supervisors in order to do their job. Yeah. So I, was you, I was wondering if we could just follow up briefly on that. Uh, you recently led a project to try to bring together supervisors and technology. Maybe you could tell us in about two minutes or less how, what that project was about. Sure, I'd be happy to. So two years we were facing this problem, these challenges and opportunities. And like we were, how do we bring together supervisors and regulators to work with the top technologists in the world? Because we have the technologies, but we don't, we don't have the off-the-shelf solutions for the central banks, or not, not very good ones. So how do we get them to work together? We had to think about a new process, and we really uh, borrowed so many techniques from the technology industry, from fintech, in terms of lean development, user-centered um, products. So we consider the supervisors and the regulators our final client, and we work all the product around them. And we built this initiative, which is called Direct Tech for Regulator Accelerator, where we tested this approach in the Philippines, in Mexico, and through the data stack project also in Nigeria in a similar way. And the idea was to prototype some advanced solutions for supervision and regulation. Terrific, so I think we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the experiments that you led through this project. And fortunately we have Rochelle from the BSP to talk a little bit about that. So Rochelle, the Philippines is one of the fastest growing economies in Asia, and the central bank is trying to ensure that that growth is benefiting everyone by focusing on financial inclusion. So tell us a little bit about what challenges BSP faces in supervising firms during this period of rapid change, and why did you decide to go to the R2A project for help? Um, thank you, Chris. Um, so as you mentioned, financial inclusion is one of our key strategic objectives in the BSP because we do believe that even if you have a very strong, very well-financed financial system, if it only serves the minority and not the majority of the population of the Philippines, the financial sector is not serving anyone at all. Um, and because of um, the, the um, extent of the financial sector, we do have about 600 banks 40 of which are big commercial banks, and the rest are smaller banks that are focused um, in uh, rural areas and serving the needs of the populations over there. We have, uh, our key challenge was really on being able to supervise all of these financial, and we are just talking about banks. I have not yet mentioned the non-banks that we are supervising, about 17,000 pawn shops, um, other money service providers, virtual currency exchanges. We have that, uh, so many players already in the market. And as regulators, um, we need to be able to see the entire picture so that we can make decisions on which areas are risky. And to be able to make that judgment, we need good data. 
And to be able to have good data, we need robust systems. And Ms. Simona mentioned computing power now is to the roof. But as regulators, as in the earlier plenary, they said regulators are usually risk averse and usually very traditional in their approach. So it's the same case in the BSP in terms of adopting technology. Um, and our main motivation really to, to engage in the R2A project is we have been espousing fintechs. We have been um, allowing our financial institutions to test and learn and pilot projects that will, and products and services that will enable financial inclusion and deliver uh, new types of products using new business models in the market. So why not use the same principle in terms of our own work as regulators? If, the, if our supervised institutions are using fintechs, we should use fintechs as well. So we know the environment and we know how it really works and we know how to incubate, so as, as they say, and use that technology for our own purposes as supervisors to enhance our own processes as well as our risk decision-making um, um, capability. Yes, yeah, so as a former supervisor myself, I understand very well that regulators around the world find themselves often drowning in data and, and trying to find new ways of using data or better ways of using their data. Why couldn't BSP simply buy something off the shelf? Why did you need to seek a customized solution? Okay, so um, let me just do a one step back and say that we do have two solutions that are under prototype in the R2A project. So one is the API for regulatory reporting with back office um, visualization and one data warehouse. So I think that question will refer to that use case at this point. Um, off the shelf, of course, there are a lot of off the shelf um, uh, products out there. But then every regulate, the requirement of every regulator is unique in, 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 um, in ways that we have different regulations in place. So for example, in the Philippines, our reporting package is anchored on, of course, internal regulations and laws um, that govern the entire financial system. And these the reports should be an are anchored always on these regulations. So customization is key for us to be able to identify um, uh, risk areas really well. It, off the shelf, even off the shelf products require some form of customization, even so if you're a regulator, because you do want to see where, um, you do want to be able to um, use that product to fit your purposes. So I don't think off the shelf can work. It may, but then at some point you will have to customize. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Monique, we've been talking about data and how to use data and supervisors want to use data. And I read an interesting blog post on the World Bank's website recently, and it said that, Rwanda, uh, that Rwanda is a country with an ambitious financial inclusion data and a data-driven culture. And the blog posting went on to suggest that Rwanda has an almost insatiable demand for accurate, high-frequency data to monitor financial inclusion progress. So, is that a fair description of your country? And how does the National Bank of Rwanda fill that demand for data? Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, there are many ways of de describing uh, the country, but uh, data and evidence-based policy making um, and accountability is one such aspect when it comes to Rwanda. We believe in really, if you don't know about it, then you don't care about it or don't know how to actually address it. So it's uh, the culture of data, yes. Uh, it's something that's good. And uh, we needed to account uh, for so many things. Uh, it can be how many are included. It can be sex disaggregated data. It can be rural versus urban. Yeah, that's really uh, something that's very important for us. And particularly with data on financial inclusion, that's something that uh, a demand was created uh, back in 2008 when we had the first uh, demand side data a FinScope survey, which was externally actually conducted. Uh, and since then, every four years, we have had a FinScope uh, survey. And the central bank has come to actually own that process together with the, uh, the National Institute of Statistics and um, a partner, uh, a local partner, uh, Access to Finance Rwanda. And in between, the two rounds of the FinScope survey, say four years, then you wonder, what's happening? Because you have data that is getting older and older every year. 
And the challenge was, Central Bank, can't you reproduce some administrative information for us? Uh, for instance, the chief gender monitor was really pushing us on, show us that, that how are you accounting for this constitutional principle of gender equity? And we felt that need, but also there was this AFI and making commitments on financial inclusion, and we said, we need really to know what is happening for financial inclusion. So we started really thinking about supply side data, which is really key uh, for two reasons, mainly for our own uh, role as central banker, uh, we need to know what is happening. Uh, we need to uh, improve on our analytics of the offsite um, uh, reports we get from financial institutions. And you have so many, by the way. We have banks, you have insurance, you have pensions, you have even microfinance institutions and savings and credit uh, organization, cooperatives, circles, in thousands. So, I mean, in hundreds. Like the circles, we have close to 500. How, how reasonably can you really do a reasonable off-site analysis of all, all those reports, including forex bureaus, uh, MNOs, payments uh, system operators and service providers. So it made really sense to go this harnessing technology to improve on our offsite. But then there was also another objective of monitoring financial inclusion, which is another key mandate for us. So that's really how we, the appetite really was kind of reinforced. Yes. And with access to better data, how has that changed the way your central bank approaches financial inclusion? Or supervision. Yeah. Supervision. Uh, I kind of allowed it uh, to eat. Uh, mainly, we are putting a more focus now on off-site analysis, yeah, which is really critical. Uh, and I think I, I really, your point, uh, the governor resonated with us, because you can only do so many uh, on-site supervisions a year. And risks are always around and every, everywhere. So you need really an alternative. So what is changing now is how do you become efficient on off-site analysis? So data is one thing, but also you need capacity. You need analytical capacity. You need also to make sure that the staff actually can understand starting from the, the, the quality of that data that is getting onto the system. So you need to chase it back to the source and, and really know, is it really garbage in, garbage out? Or it's really the real, real things coming on board? You need to, to look at um, a, a balance sheet and see whether it's making sense or not. So you really need to go deeper and smarter with the, the, the quality of your staff. So it, that, that's another change that is coming on board. And also, um, we are focusing, we have come up with a set of uh, regulations on some of the non-financial, non-prudential things, like market conduct, for instance, uh, like uh, governance, like really inclusive uh, uh, financial inclusion. How then do you make sure you also do conduct supervision if you don't have non-financial uh, information. So this is really the new changes that are coming from the side of our do supervision. Thanks. Yes. So Dr. Monique, you hit on a very important point, and that is how does the use of this technology change the needs of training and capacity building within a central bank, which I definitely want to come back to after we uh, finish our discussion of data. So thank you very much for those points. Uh, Dr. Setter. Ghana as well has seen a lot of growth in the use of digital financial services and the Bank of Ghana has been tr trying to address this issue of gathering data as well. And I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about the web-based portal that Ghana has developed and how has that changed the way you do supervision? Thank you very much. Um, this year, GPF, there are key themes that came up and one of the issues that I'm taking whom is trust and confidence in the payment system to be able to scale up. Either you are using fintech or you are using non-bank or you are using the banking sector to deepen your payment system. So 
Bank of Ghana realized this some um, years back. What we did was to provide this trust and confidence to scale up uh, financial inclusion. We use our own staff, our IT department, to develop a web-based portal. The reason is, some years back when I was in banking supervision, we were using the analog system of supervision. But I think you all agree that the world has moved on. And um, you cannot continue using that manual system. The red tech that we are discussing today, in a simple term, is employing information technology to enhance regulatory processes. That is the definition in the literature. So what we did was to use our internal resources, whereby banks, mobile money operators, fintech that report to us don't need to send returns to us through email, to send returns to us through paper-based system. You can be at the comfort of your home, even you can be in Sochi here, with your password and system ID. You do your work and that my staff in payment system department. Y uh, el departamento lo ha evalu eh, evaluado y eso ayuda a mejorar la, el funcionamiento. También hemos uh, desarrollado los registradores y eh, registradores de agentes. Tenemos todos los recursos internos para esto. Tenemos confianza en nuestro departamento informático. Tenemos más de 200.000 y no podemos tener el sistema analógico para proporcionar la confianza. Eso era la clave para atraer a los proveedores y proporcionar el registro de agentes que pueda también llevar a los beneficios en futuro. Las uh, quejas de consumidor. Los uh, consumidores pueden en, uh, dejar las reclamaciones y esto también sucede en el proceso de onboarding. El proceso, el objetivo nuestro es identificar los diferentes agentes e incluirlos en el sistema y eh, tener este proveedor en uh, el sistema de agente. Después el monitoreo, hemos solo el, vemos que está pasando en el sistema, pero para los beneficios implementado el mismo sistema basado en nuestra experiencia a mí me gustaría compartir unos puntos que tenemos que considerar primero es la capacidad de empleados y también hay que eh, regularmente renovar la plataforma y después es la tecnología de cambio la tecnología nunca es estática y incluso si usamos los recursos eh, internos para hacer el re registro de, para nosotros, eh, los uh, proveedores de servicios van a obtener los datos GPS de todos los agentes y necesitamos asegurarles de in estar incluido en esto, incluso si lleva un costo uh, adicional. El uh, Banco Central de Ghana ha, eh, ha empleado esta situación y adoptando esta uh, tecno tecnología, uh, usted uh, tarda más tiempo para hacerlo o el mismo tiempo. Gracias. Nosotros somos 18. Y eso significa que no podemos tener el sistema manual para todo. Desde el momento de aplicación de la tecnología, eso nos ayuda a ahorrar el tiempo. Y por eso puedo usar mi tiempo para la regulación y el desarrollo de las recomendaciones. 
eso también reduce el costo para el Banco Central, el costo para los consumidores y el costo para proveedores de servicios. Gracias. Esto es un desarrollo muy importante. Eh, ha mencionado que eh, tiene confianza en le, recursos internos y nosotros eh, también eh, y, eh, atraemos las consulto los consultores externos. ¿Puede usted eh, hablar un poco de cómo funciona esa dinámica, cómo viene la tecnología? si hay alguna tensión dinámica en este respecto. Como he mencionado, estábamos muy abiertos para las innovaciones en el mercado. Incluso internamente teníamos el acceso, dábamos el acceso a, la, eh, a las tecnologías. Cuando llegan las tecnologías, nosotros tenemos el diálogo. La primera barrera para el entendimiento son los términos y el nivel de tecnología, por, porque eh, lo entendemos que nuestra tecnología que hemos eh, comprado es, eh, ya está, eh, no está tan avanzada, ya está atrasada al mercado. Pero nosotros no podíamos entender cómo esta tecnología puede ser usada en uh, nuestro proceso regulatorio. Y este nivel de entendimiento nos lleva al uh, pensamiento qué tecnología puede uh, dar a nosotros y puede ser customizada para nuestros objetivos. Hay mucho diálogo y hay mucha interacción, mucha interacción. Y... Las, uh, la validación también, el proceso de validación, que no sea aceptable. Uh, hay mucha, uh, mucha colaboración de este tipo. Uh, las tecnologías son uh, experimentales y, nosotros, y, y están, están en el ámbito controlado. Esto siempre puede ser eh, intercambiado si no funciona y si no sirve para no nuestros objetivos. Pero el, incluso los especialistas de informáticos um, dicen que hay uh, eh, no, no bastante entendimiento, no llega el entendimiento de las tecnologías. Nosotros como los niños pequeños Lo más importante aquí es apoyar a ellos y eh, también atraerles para la discusión, para el diálogo. Entonces, nosotros no solo tenemos el objetivo de probar no, no nuevos prototipos, pero to también todos los uh, bancos centrales en los cinco años van, vamos a poder interaccionar en otras vías con otras oportunidades. La solución de la solución en Filipinas es uh, uh, como una quinta de todas las soluciones en Ruanda. Es que hay un proceso um, de añadimiento de tecnologías en nuestro equipo. A veces yo también tengo que uh, en, también tengo estudiar y para poder entender con ellos y el desarrollo de prototipo y estar seguro para estar seguro que es muy ambicioso en términos de tecnología. La otra cosa es el proceso que uh, es beneficioso. Los innovadores eh, sabemos que, saben que necesita el Banco Central y están dispuestos a hablar más del proyecto. Sí, es muy importante para saber interpretar entre dos partes. En el proyecto de Nigeria, en vez de llamar a un vendedor uh, externo, nosotros gastamos tiempo para uh, desarrollar las capacidades en el Banco Central de Nigeria. Es, es que pa para que ellos puedan hacer su propio desa desarrollo. Tenemos que ser oportunistas para eh, entender cómo las tecnologías, nos, qué oportunidades nos pueden dar tecnologías. 
y esto también va a impactar a los proyectos de largo plazo y el desarrollo futuro de las soluciones. Entonces, tienen buenos resultados en uh, llamar juntos uh, innovadores, tecno tecnologías innovadores y reguladores. Uh, hay algunas cosas que usted no ha esperado. Gracias. Una cosa que yo estaba pensando... Nosotros prevemos que podía ser muy fácil para las instituciones financieras eh, estar también involucrados en el desarrollo, que son avanzados, que tienen capacidades. Y esto era un desafío que teníamos que enfrentarnos. Y nosotros hemos encontrado y empezamos a tener pánico. Si tenemos bastante equipos de confianza o tienen ellos como los proveedores, esto es, uh, era algo nuevo para nosotros. También yo creo que la, los datos no financieros como el conocimiento de si este cliente es uh, mujer o hombre o si es uh, la empresa o no, este es, uh, estos son los datos no financieros y es muy difícil uh, involucrarlos al sistema porque esto es requerimiento a la persona en el front office que hay eh, formularios y si no si están eh, llenados correctamente. ¿Cómo nosotros podemos tener el control de esto y cómo eh, los encargados de instituciones financieras pueden eh, proveer esto. Si estás seguro que tu equipo está um, recogiendo los datos relevantes porque esto va a impactar la estrategia de, de, del desarrollo, ¿cómo podemos estar seguros de que los datos relevantes están captados. Esto no es, uh, no es uh, muy necesario para los uh, bancos uh, de centrales o para instituciones financieras. ¿Hay algo más que decir? Sí, el uh, consejo que yo doy a mis colegas en otros bancos centrales es que no debemos uh, no debemos uh, poner todo en la tecnología. Incluso si eh, está, está, eh, está cambiando muy rápidamente. Eh, depende del tipo de tecnología que usamos. Voy a dar el, exam, ex, el ejemplo. Eh, una herramienta de, eh, para eh, generar eh, los informes que sea compatible con nuestro sistema operativo. Nosotros pensábamos que era bueno para nosotros, pero como hemos empezado uh, a renovar nuestro sistema, realizamos que necesitamos otra herramienta. Si usamos tecnología para ampliar los procesos regulatorios, hay necesidad para eso y estoy de acuerdo con mi colega de Filipinas. Yo creo en uh, empoderamiento de nuestros empleados, porque si eso tenemos, las renovaciones de futuro serán más fáciles. Yo creo que el problema clave es explicar el proceso a los empleados informáticos para que entiendan muy bien lo que tenemos, tienen que hacer. Tenemos que explicarles qué, qué tipo de proceso será. Y lo que eh, estamos, estamos estudiando no es lo que tenemos que desarrollar, lo que dicen los especialistas de tecnologías. El, la persona 
uh, tiene que preguntar a los gerentes que necesita este tipo de los empleados y nosotros así podremos refinizar todo el proceso desarrollo de capacidades dentro del Banco Central es crucial. Tenemos uh, tiempo para dos preguntas del auditorio y voy a hacer la última pregunta a los panelistas. ¿Hay preguntas del auditorio? Gracias. Entonces, ¿cómo usted ve que RecTech ayuda a promover más el desarrollo de datos de la parte de las instituciones regulatorias? Hemos uh, escuchado que no es uh, uh, sostenible hacerlo on-site, pero off-site, examinaciones off-site, deben ser más sólidos. Lo que uh, tenemos ahora en Ghana, tenemos mucha variación en, eh, de, entre lo que obtenemos y lo que eh, eh, en, real, en realidad. Y la segunda cuestión, y después vamos a eh, abordar estas preguntas juntas. Gracias. Me llamo Bismetemi. Hay una pregunta muy corta. Me interesa si usted tenía que cambiar las, uh, poli las políticas de datos dentro del Banco Central o regulaciones dentro del Banco Central. para asegurarse de que los proveedores de servicios uh, pro, proveen, proporcionan estos datasets. Y me, a mí me interesa cómo ustedes tienen esta situación y cuál es la discusión con uh, los proveedores de servicios. Vamos a contestar estas preguntas juntos. La primera pregunta, muy rápidamente. Yo creo que usted no solo tiene confianza en tecnología como regulador, porque en Capitas decimos eh, basura, entra basura, sale. Los, ban los bancos... Eh, deben mandar la información y si los supervisores asumen que lo que, se, lo que manda el banco es la información correcta, nosotros no eh, volvemos a confirmar para chequear la integridad de estos datos. Eh, tenemos esta situación en Ghana. Mi la sugerencia es que RecTech es uh, solo la tecnología y hay gente que entrega la información en el sistema y tiene que estar consciente de comprobar la información. De, en cuanto a mi experiencia, en los últimos 15 años, y la segunda uh, cuestión fue relacionada también a un poco a esto. Weaving it into the whole central bank and regulatory process and so on. Yeah. Yes, uh, a comment on the data integrity. Uh, I think the garbage in the garbage out risk is always there, uh, but there are ways of going around it. Um, our system we are trying is actually fetching from source, and it's updating every 15 minutes. And even if you were really meaning to manipulate, you wouldn't be manipulating every 15 minutes the data that gets onto the system. And that's why also the analytical capacity of the staff has to come in. Because you have uh, to know, actually, uh, almost like you are an account manager of 
a certain uh, financial institution and you need to know what data that is coming that is not making sense. But also the system can also be designed so that it alerts you when there are incoherences in the data that is being submitted. So it, it, I, I agree with you, the human really um, capacity will always be needed to really check those things uh, and also we need to use the system also to help us as much as possible in automating a certain uh, things yeah, for the system to actually the, the business intelligence part of it yes. to tell you what is it. So you need to use more than just the technology. There are other things you need to employ as well. It's just one of the many tools. So, Simone, like 30 seconds or less. Yeah. Very fast, but yeah. uh, there is this point of taking better data from the financial service providers, but also you don't rely any longer as a regulator supervisor from those data or from the data from the mensite service. Like with direct tech and sub tech solutions, now you can analyze social media mm -hmm. and get your data directly for what people are talking about. With the chatbot solution, now you have a direct bridge, a direct dialogue with the customers, and they are telling you what's going on in the financial sector. You have the analytical, analytical capability to act timely on that. With the data stack, you are really uh, having a triangulation of different data sets uh, from so many different resources in your country that tell you like what data you can use and where the reflex are and where the risk is, so to implement a risk-based approach in your work. So I think it's really a revolution in the way to think about data and technology within central banks. It's, it's much bigger than perhaps what we have an opportunity to discuss in 50 minutes. Yes, absolutely. So we're going to end there, and I want to propose a lunchtime discussion topic. Uh, Dr. Monika talked about how the staffing may, needs may change in the central bank, and we need to build capacity. So I'd like you all to think about what does the supervisor of the future look like when we have artificial intelligence? We will still have human supervisors? Will there be a need for humans to do this, or will we be replaced? And if we're, if we're still going to do this job, what does that job look like? So we'll stop there, break for lunch. Please join me in thanking our panel for this excellent discussion on the use of technology and regulation.